Antoinette Harrell has found evidence that slavery has never truly ended in the United States. From 1865 to 1965, she believes may have been the most brutal times of slavery in the United States. Her studies have shown that from 1865 until now, two new forms of slavery have quickly evolved, pinnage and involuntary servitude. The essence of all slavery consists in the taking of the product of another's labor by force. It is immaterial whether this force be founded upon ownership of the slave or ownership of the money that he must get to live. Leo Tolstoy. Everything tells a story. And most of the artwork that I have is, is people that have watched the work over the years and wanted to give me something in, as a symbolic figure of what was going on. Tainted Harvest is one of the art pieces in my collection. And the woman is sitting on a cotton sack, giving birth, and you can see that her water bag had burst, and uh, she was ready now to give birth. But yes, she had shackles on and tennis shoes of the modern day time. And the tennis shoes of the modern day time remind me of the modern day plantations and the shackles that are still on their feet when they cannot uh, get out of the forms of slavery. So explain to us, what is penage? Penage is a system of that someone uh, have agreed to work off a debt. And if that debt is not paid, you are held in a condition of penage. You can, you can be punished, you can be held, you can be placed in jail for not paying that debt. And so when I think about the penish today, I think about people who have credit cards and credit that they can't, so much credit, they can't get out of debt. The grounds where my, my grandfather, mother, Emma Mead Harrell, purchased this land in 1896. And this place is dear to me because, you know, for families that still have land that has been a family all that long ago, is a legacy and, and I visit this place a lot because I feel like I'm walking on the grounds that my ancestors walked on and so it's just besides being sentimental I want to see this land be formed land again. Antoinette Harrell is a highly recognized Louisiana and Mississippi historian. She began her journey as a genealogist. No matter when I called my mother, she would immediately start talking about family members uh, that was deceased. Every time, it never fell. And so one day I said, what is she trying to tell me? So I purchased a camcorder and started recording these stories and documenting these stories for my mom. And in doing so, I'm thinking like everyone else that starts to research genealogy. I'm thinking that I'm gonna be excited because I'm finding marriage license, photographs, and all of these things. I'm thinking that I'm gonna be very excited. Well, I was excited because I did find those things. 
And when finding those things, I also found things that was very alarming to me, although I knew the history of slavery like anyone else. During a genealogy summit, she met a lady who told her she had been a slave in Mississippi until 1961, until she escaped. Mary Louise Walls Miller. I met her in 2000. I was doing a, uh, conducting a seminar, a town hall meeting on genealogy and reparations. And she walked into the meeting and she said, look, my family was held as slaves in the, in, you know, the 1960 in Liberty, Mississippi. I believed her. Now other people was listening, how could that be? But I had met people in St. John and St. Charles Parish that had really uh, told me their story, maybe like a year before that. But they were too afraid for their lives and they did not want me to go public with their stories at all, their life experience at all. And I respect that. Her meeting with May ignited a deep desire in Antoinette to inform people about what May's family and other families had experienced. My words was to May, May, if you would tell your story, I would prove without a shadow of a doubt that you are telling the truth. Well, she did. She gave me the story. She told me about her life experience. According to the history books, slavery ended in 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. In 1868, Blacks were afforded citizenship in the radical Reconstruction movement caused by the 14th Amendment. And in 1870, Black men could vote with the 15th Amendment. But these stories sharply contrast with people who actually lived in and grew up in areas where slavery was most prevalent. I assume that 1865 or 1863 was the end of slavery. Slavery was emancipated and I thought that was it. But what I did find was people that lived on plantations a hundred years later, when the whole world, the whole entire world just assumed that slavery had ended, but it wasn't true. Although slavery was federally abolished in 1863, it wasn't until much later that it was eradicated in the state of Mississippi. 1995, and it was Congressman Benny Thompson that introduced the bill to have uh, slavery eradicated off the books and off the statute in Mississippi in 1995. It was still legal to hold people as slaves in Mississippi. Slaves who were set free in 1865 quickly found themselves in new, different kinds of slavery. One of the new types of slavery was pinnage. So how did someone fall into pinnage? Well, what happened when slavery was emancipated in 1863, a lot of the planters had no idea what they was going to do to maintain their large farms. So the newly freed Africans, enslaved Africans, they were so excited, just bubbling with joy. I'm free, I'm free. And the one question that they settled down, where are we going to go? How are we going to survive? We have no food, no clothes, nowhere to go. They created a plan, a contract called the Freeman Labor Contracts in which the planter and the, the newly freed person enter into this contract. I found people, young people as young as five years old, with their ex on the contract, bonding them to, this, to plantations. Millions of former slaves, now calling themselves sharecroppers, found themselves in contractual loan agreements to rent tools, livestock, and land. Many of the contracts were outrageous. The sharecroppers believed that the crops they were raising would be enough to pay back the plantation owners, but they were deeply mistaken. Not only would they not be able to pay back their loans, but if they tried to run away, they would be beat and thrown in jail, or much worse. They saw people that was murdered. They heard the stories. If you didn't see it, you heard it. You know what happened. You can end up being a chain gang, uh, thrown into prisons, or murdered or anything. And that's what happened to a lot of the people that uh, talked about what took place. We have to keep in mind now that the system uh, was created. There was sheriffs involved, there was uh, uh, politicians involved, there was wealthy business people involved uh, with this system called penage and involuntary servitude. Her genealogy research has led to some unthinkable truths about the South and those who 
control it. Cases, cases. I could not believe the number of cases that I was finding with people held as slaves in the 20th century. I'm saying, oh my goodness, this is one of the best kept secrets in America. Former slaves or their children were being kidnapped and sold, most never seen again. Eco and Ico was a minor uh, twins, and he was kidnapped by the Clyde Peters Circus. Uh, they was very, very talented in the music uh, uh, world, so they had musical uh, skills, and it was used for that purpose. But at that time, people's children was being kidnapped and, and, and used in circles to p perform. Like the person they called Monkey Girl. You know, they would just wow. steal people's, kidnap people's children. The last known public document publicizing a slave trade was in Time magazine in 1927. But slavery, which is now termed human trafficking, simply faded from the front of the newspapers into the back streets, the woods, and the swamps of Florida and the Delta. Roger Dean was one of the prisoners or slaves in the Florida Reform School for Boys. Recently, nearly 100 graves of children were found by a University of South Florida research team. Roger Dean claims that many of these children were killed during his stay at the school. So I had heard that they would come to various dormitories, and there was 12 dormitories, and they would take certain boys uh, that they thought wouldn't fight, and the younger they were, the better they liked them. And one night I'm in bed, I guess it's probably, I'm just guessing, 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and the next thing you know, three or four men come walking into our dormitory, and it, there's, a, there's a light on it. It's, it's, it's not really a light. It's just a, sort of the shadow of a light, so you can see figures walking, but you can't tell who they are. It's not that light. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, this man jerks me up by, we had to wear nightgowns, we couldn't have any clothes in there, so we couldn't run away. And he pulled me up out of the bed, and he said, well, it looks like this little bastard can suck a, you know what. Oh, and wow. so I'm just, oh, I thought, oh, God, oh, God. Well, the next thing you know, I'm being taken out of the cottage onto the basketball court, which was a red clay court. And then I just freaked out and started yelling and screaming. I fell to the ground and started kicking. And Mr. Sealander, my college father, came out and get away from that boy, get away from that boy, I'll call the authorities on you. And so that was the only experience I had, uh, which Mr. Sealander saved me. He took me back in the cottage and put me in the shower and washed my nightgown and everything off and, and I went to bed. But there was, uh, that was constant. There wasn't a night go by that somebody wasn't coming into the cottage and taking a boy to one of the 12 cottages. And if the boy gave him a hard time, they would kill him. Yes, are they still, I think they're still investigating and trying to see if there's any more bodies on the campus. Am I correct? The University of South Florida Anthropology Department has found bodies all the way from the 31 graves all the way to the dump. And we're sure there's bodies that are buried in the dump as well. That's mm -hmm. what they It's really amazing, shocking to me that so many people disappeared. When no one heard from these people again. They were just... That brings me to... The attention brings me to mind now about the young men that was kidnapped in Simpson County, Mississippi, and sold over to Clarksdale, and what the letter said that we disposed of them. But they didn't say how they disposed of them. And so every time I see a child or a young person missing now, the first thing comes to my mind, what happened to them? Are they sold into, as sex slaves or their body parts being sold? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of variables. Yeah. I was helping a slave from when I was born, until I guess I was about 17 or 18, I really don't know because I couldn't count. The experiences of May's childhood and the fear she and her family still lived in ignited a deep fire of interest in Antoinette. She wanted to find out how common this unpublicized hidden slavery was in the South. Pulling corn, picking peas, picking butter beans, Picking string beans, digging potatoes, whatever it was, that's what you did for no money at all. How old were you when this started? I was five when I was working. He saw a white man or something yes. on TV, and he asked you not to even come back around. Well, well, explain what happened. Him. It was his um, He was watching TV, and he saw this white man on the television, and he thought that the white man was coming to get him 
because of what he told me about what happened to him and his family. Uh, he was hospitalized for that, and I was told that I couldn't come back around the family to talk to them anymore because they didn't want to see anything happen to their father. And it was maybe like two years before I went back around the family and, you know, it sort of eased up a little bit. And uh, the oldest daughter, she sort of felt a little bit relaxed then. But her, the father said, and this was his words, let that baby come and talk to me. So much fear was in her life. The more Antoinette what researched, kind of the more the stories of slavery conditions that were unfathomable. Did you ever think there was no way out? Or he talked about the man going fishing and cutting up the babies and going fishing with them. And so somebody would warn them, get your babies in tonight, they'll be going fishing tonight. And so when I read about the alligator bait, uh, using babies for alligator baits, that really, all of those stories was something that uh, reminded me of something that was told to me in oral history and just reading what uh, uh, some of the documents in the, in the Department of Justice, you know. And when we talk about the NAACP files, we're talking about people like uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall, James Weldon Johnson, uh, Mary Churchill Terrell. She was another person that was writing uh, as a journalist on what she was seeing and what was coming in. I was very surprised that with their story being featured in People Magazine and, and Nightline News, that a lot of people still did not get involved. I thought more people would have gotten involved, you know, with uh, national uh, media publications such as those two I just named. You, you talked with May and her family, and they told you about some of the things, the stories that had happened to her. When the family started talking to me about it, it was like reading the books that I had read on the subject of Penn. Uh, the same, it was almost the same for different people in different locations, uh, the murders that took place, the rapes that took place, the beatings that took place, uh, not having enough food to eat, living in shamies, uh, being hired out to different plantations, uh, the things that would, we would consider to be worse than slavery. Uh, it was really horrible. And one of the things that May uh, shared with me is that how they had to eat lizards and uh, bird eggs and things like that. And she said that one time her brother uh, killed the bird and they got the bird eggs and was eating the bird eggs because they were so hungry. And the white lady was so upset because they killed the bird wow. and ate the eggs. Wow. The bird was more important to her. Wow. And they were starving. In the National Archives, Antoinette found countless documents on two subjects, the political names of modern-day slavery, pinage, and involuntary servitude. I really wasn't ready for what I was going to find. I had uh, read a book that led me there, and it talked about the hundreds of thousands of cases that was there. But when I got there, I found cases uh, from the NAACP written to the FBI, uh, Attorney General files, Department of Justice files. What was really, really uh, got my attention was letters to the presidents, three presidents of the United States, uh, Calvin Coolidge, uh, it was Theodore Roosevelt, and Warren Harding. And that was such a, sh a shock to me that citizens as well as the Attorney Generals was writing uh, and asking the presidents at that time to free uh, people from the bonds of slavery. The stories tormented Antoinette, and she began a crusade to inform people and to abolish the remnants of slavery that were still going on. What are a few of the, the letters that stand out? That... Mary Ellen Foster. She was begging the governor of Mississippi. She had wrote her mother and asked, and she asked her mother to come and free her and her children, that they were held as slaves, they were being beat, and she asked her mother uh, to uh, go to the governor. And I can tell that she has some form of education, some learning how to read and write, because the letter was, it was an original letter written in her handwriting. And then another letter uh, that was written uh, by Governor Earl Brewer at the time, 1915. He was asking the Attorney General to investigate uh, cases of penitent and involuntary, involuntary servitude in Mississippi. 
he was talking about how pitiful Negroes had come into his office and they had been complaining about the way that they was being beat and held against their will at gunpoint. Uh, letters to the President, um, Thurgood Marshall, one of the most pitiful letters that I've read in the National Archives is of Ethel Lee Davis. She was um, held with a trace chain around her neck and, and she was uh, locked to the bedpost. And when the sheriff went over to get her uh, to ask the man what was going on, he said, the goddamn niggas keep running away on me. So he had her not only by the trace chain, uh, chained to the bed, but he also had a gun, had a at gunpoint. And that wasn't uncommon for those type of activities to take place. Uh, May's father told me uh, that he, uh, his uncle had to dig, dig his own grave and then he shot him and um, put him over to the grave. People started coming to you? And... Yes, I had a lot of people to contact me. Okay. Uh, universities, I had uh, television and radio talk shows, mostly radio talk shows uh, would contact me to want to talk to me about what it was that uh, they had heard about. Educate us on what is going on um, in the Delta. Well, you know, Mississippi is one of the poorest states in the nation. It's the America's third world country. And in the Mississippi Delta, you still see cotton from can't see to can't see. Soybeans from can't see to can't see. Coin, can't see to can't see. And there's still brothers and sisters who are still living on plantations. Um, I know people ask the question, why can't they leave? Why can't they leave off the plantations? There's no money, there's no jobs. Uh, the nearest job may be 40 to 45 miles away. Uh, but there was still more doubt than it was people believing uh, that it actually happened. The first thing many people said is that could not be true. And although we had produced a documentary called uh, slavery in the 20th century, the untold story. And there was documents in it, and people just would think that these was not real documents. And so they really didn't stop to think, wait a minute, I'm accusing the Department of Justice. I am accusing the FBI. I am saying that documents that was put there by Thurgood Marshall, I am saying that there was letters to the presidents of the United States. Who would forge such record? I've seen towns that's not incorporated, meaning there's no infrastructure at all in these towns. Uh, some of these towns have no mayor, no city council. There's no one to, to run those towns. Uh, the nearest job may be 45 miles or could be an hour away. Uh, there's no public transportation. I've seen towns with absolutely not one library, one community center, or a doctor's office, or a dentist's office. The conditions are, the conditions are real bad. Uh, I've seen houses with snakes inside the homes where the sister could not even sleep because the snake was inside the home. As um, the stories rolled in, Antoinette began traveling up and down the Delta helping families. Each time I would scan a document, I would go back uh, to the hotel that night and look at the documents and I would create a database of the, the state as well as the counties or parishes where people was held. And because I live in Louisiana, Mississippi and Louisiana was two states that was really, uh, that really caught my interest, be interest because my family was in, lived in Mississippi as well as Louisiana. And so when I found a document that said Mississippi, Delta, uh, if it was Tallahassee County, or wherever it was, Webb, Mississippi, I would really write it down, pinpoint it, get my map and make my way there. Uh, many homes have no running in, indoor plumbing, some of the homes, uh, there is no heat in the home. So in the wintertime, uh, they're cooking with hot plates. Uh, that's how they cook their meal. They gather in one room to try to heat that room uh, uh, to make sure there's some heat in the house. I've also seen those dusty roads, those gravel roads that's very dusty. And when a car or a truck come down that road, you should see the dust. It's almost like something off the color purple or some movie. Uh, the heat of the night or something like that. But in 2011, I certainly didn't think that I would be seeing these type of conditions, but it opened my mind. It all started because I'm thinking that I was going to go in there and talk to 
former sharecroppers and their descendants and just hear what they had to say. But I wasn't, so, uh, I wasn't prepared for what I was going to see. I was ignorant to the fact like so many other millions of people in America. And when I got into Glendora and I went into the store, you know, I just was shocked by what I saw as a store. You know, and when I found out that he was a former mayor. Now, we have to keep in mind that a lot of the people that's in leadership is only maybe like uh, one check away from being homeless themselves. Their conditions are not that much greater. When I got 14 years old, I got married. And me and my wife, got we got, we got 10 acres of land from the um, Bobby Shea crop. We worked that 10 acres of land by hand because you didn't have no, no practice at that time. Did she have a mule? Mule. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And so we worked that land and then the mule was a mule. Mm-hmm. And so we applied, I applied, and the other people that were sharecropping there, when I get behind, they come help me, and then I would go to the field and help them. At 14 people. years old? Uh-huh. At 14. The man gave me $100 before I started the crop, and once the crop was in it, we worked the whole season out, and I think I got 10 and a half bales of cotton out of that 10 acres. It made probably the way it looked like about a bale to acre. Then, Did you go to school at that time, A.D.? Uh, no. Whenever we got a chance to go to school, let's chase their call Grayson Chapel. Every once in a while we get a day or so that we can go to school. Mm-hmm. About the time I got uh, uh, 13 or 14 before I started sharecropping, man come around and told my mother, that, boy, I got to, you know, go to the field and do some work. And when it come weekend, you come to town and to Glendora, it was, had a lot of villains in there at that point. Chinamen and, and uh, Jews and different, different little grocery stores that played a crowd of little stores, but you only could come to town on Saturday. And why and only on Saturdays? Uh, well, you had to be off the street. There were no, none, none of the young people who had grown up and around here my age. They, they wouldn't come to town during the weekday. Man, anybody saw you in town during the weekday, I should leave and, well, they tell you to leave and go back on the plantation. You're supposed to be in the field, get out of there, out enough there, you know. You work from sun up to sun down. It's all on the plantation. You get up early in the morning, you work until the sun goes out. At 14 years old. I wasn't the only one. All, all, it was, it everybody was, else was doing the same. Was the same. Did you ever dream about leaving this place? Uh, as soon as I got married, I stayed, I stayed there a couple more years, and then I called my sister. That was shortly, that was shortly after the Emmett Hill. I called my sister and told her that happened. She asked me what I did I want to come to Ohio. Oh, you told her what happened to Emmett Hill? Uh-huh. I told her that some young boy had got killed and plus it was another young man. I happened to be up there on Saturday night. It was a come and stay a store on the other end of town, yet you crossed the railroad. And I was there and a white man come up and told that man that Billy Trucker had them old type of trucks back then. Billy Trucker was dead. His name was Mr. Kimmel. And the uh, boy working in the church for the white man was sending Milton, Bob Milton, so. Yeah. That man come out of the store and told son and said, you feel my tank up? He said, yes, sir, I feel it. He said, I didn't take you to fill it up. It was simple back then. But that's how easy your life would go. And he said, I didn't tell you to fill it up. Well, we all know what he did. He knew what he did because he asked him, did he fill the tank up? And the boy did, yeah, he said, well, you saw I told him, called him man, and said, then I told you, and you calling me a lie. He went to the truck and got a shotgun out. Shotgun come in. Well, what, 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 what I You see, saw that? I saw it from my own eye. Well, I can see, yeah, it must have been almost as he was going. I don't know if they have any record of picture of, it, of that back then. I know it's records of it, but. I don't know if they had any pictures anywhere or not because I left after that. Life had to be so difficult. Life always has been. 
difficult around here for mm -hmm. black folk because there is no job, no anything here. Uh, uh, it, you, you just have to grind and do whatever you can do here, and that ain't much. And that's still to the day in 2012? Uh, uh, up until the day 2012, and, and uh, whatever come in here, if we have somebody in the office and they don't, don't do the things that I've done when I was in there, then you still ain't getting them. A man's real possession is in his memory, and nothing else is he rich, and nothing else is he poor. Alexander Smith. You know, I really didn't know how poor Mississippi was until I traveled down the Mississippi Delta, off the main highway, off the beaten path. It was almost like behind the scenes, let's pull the curtain back on really what you'll see. Because driving down the highway, the interstate, you see the beautiful trees, and you don't really see very much anything. But until you get off the main highway and you travel down some of those dusty roads, back roads, you will see poverty like never before. Raw sewage uh, in front of their homes, homes that uh, Shaney's, people still living in Shaney's. Denise's family is one of the most needy families Antoinette has come across. Her family still lives and works in the middle of a plantation sometimes making only six dollars a day. Well, we're gonna make sure that you get, look in that camera and tell me what you want. Come on, go ahead and allow what it is. Okay. You would like um, a car to ride, a place to stay. Okay. A place to stay. Well, we're gonna do all this in the summertime. Uh, I found people uh, without air conditions or fans in the winter time, there's no gas, no hot water in the house. And they may not take a bath, a shower or a bed, a full bath the entire winter because they can't afford the gas to buy the, the, the heat, the hot water. What's a shanty? A shanty is a house, a former shanty. It's just a shell, it's no insulation, nothing updated. Mm -hmm. So you found people still living in shanties? Yes, in 2000. What's the relationship between poverty and slavery? Slavery is the foundation for poverty, especially for those that did not get their freedom until 100 years later. And I have to make that very clear. find all this stuff when you're out in the, some of these houses here, things like that? Or? Yeah, I, 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 I pick them up and, and uh, the boy sometimes bring them to me. Tell, Roy, tell us about them rosin. Well, these rosin, this was a money made by Kent Mercantile Company. I reckon it started back in the 40s. I don't know, I don't know, when I was born, they had them. Ken had his own money. That now when you work, you could get some cash. But if you want to draw some, or borrow some, anything like that, you wind up with these bros in. They wouldn't want as much as cash. Now you can take cash money and trade it in and buy more. See, if you, if you trade it in, in $20 in cash, you would get like $25 in bros in, but you couldn't spend them nowhere else. You had to come back and spend them at that store. After nearly 150 years of economic infringement, hundreds of thousands of elderly people up and down the Delta have been left without retirement or ways of supporting themselves. Mr. Holmes, when you say, oh Lordy, one day I'm gonna make it, explain that to me. Well, man, I put my trust in God. Like I'm doing this right here, mm -hmm. I think one day gonna be some seeds gonna be made. I get some peas off of it. Some living off the land, 
and assess the farm. Don't work out all right. Your ancestors were farmers? Do you get any help at all? No. Well, no. I just had to do it by myself. I used to get a little help, but I, I don't. I don't worry about it no more. I just put my trust in God. I like to do it. Mr. Holmes, you do you do not sell any of your produce, huh? Yes, I know. I don't sell none of it. I can't. I can't. You can't? Tell me why you can't. Well, Senior citizen. I'm a senior citizen, and I look out for the others. Senior citizen. I look out for the rest of them. Not a good. You can't just take your time for something that uh, ancestors, blacks, want to do it. Oh, Lord. But no one ever related slavery to poverty in the Mississippi Delta. But cotton once was king. And now, you know, you see uh, thousands of acres of corn and, and soybeans, and somebody's still making lots of money, millions of dollars of money. But the people, there's not seeing any of the money. So there's a, a close relationship between slavery and poverty. I am only three generations removed from slavery. Some people are only one, and some people just got out of slavery themselves. I'm talking about young people. Problems Antoinette found were far greater than Antoinette could handle by herself. Many times, Antoinette has come across people who were content with the poverty they lived in and who don't expect anything more out of life in the Delta. Yes, Donald is caught up in the system. Um, he and his family, well, for generations, their family have been on this plantation, ball ground plantation, for generations and generations. And he lives on the plantation now. And there's a, um, some form of relationship between him and the former slave owner's children, son. Uh, and so Donald has never left this plantation. So this is one of the plantations that represent how some family members have never left the plantation. Never left Ball Ground? Never left. How many generations that in I, your family? I come, uh, I was 48 years old right now, and I was born at Team Memorial Hospital. My mama, when I come up, I was raised right across the creek over there in mm -hmm. the house, which they done moved now mm -hmm. because they, they moved a year ago because the bank the creek was caving. So they didn't want their house. Carson daddy didn't want the house to fall off in there. So his Carson granddaddy told me and my mother we can have that house around there where we at right now. We moved around there in 1986. And so y'all been there ever yeah, since? We've been there ever since 86 around there. We, we've been, my mother, we've been here. I've been here on Ball Run all my life. And my you mother. and Carson are like... we brothers. That's well, the kind of relationship y'all have. Yeah, we have a, we are brothers. You can call us brothers. My mama raised his daddy and helped raise his granddaddy, cooked and fed his granddaddy. So, Whoa. So my mama raised his daddy. Mm -hmm. My mama remember when his daddy was born and she changed his divers and bought him up. Then she moved down there with the cooking for him. And then that's when he had Carson and Mark and New York. So the relationship between your family and the Cimarron have yeah. always been what it is right now. Right, that's right. And always been there. As when I was coming up. And when my granddaddy, my my granddaddy have just as much respect for Carson daddy and granddaddy uh -huh. as me and Carson have today. They love my granddaddy. Okay, so it's been it's generations been. growing together. Right. And if you ask any one of them on the plantation, if they had an opportunity, would they leave? And they would tell you no, because at least they would tell, they would tell you, at least I have a roof over my head, 
I have somebody that I can borrow $20 from. I have somebody that would loan me their pickup truck if I need one. And why would I move somewhere and I would not have any resources at all? And so uh, Donald represents one of the families that has been on Ball Ground Plantation uh, all his life. His mother was on the plantation. Her mother was on the plantation, in the same plantation. Donald, have you worked all this land be yeah. before? Yeah, uh, all in here, yeah. oh, yes ma'am, 22 years. Donald's family still lives in the plantation in a shanty, yet they refer to the plantation owners as family. Riding back here now, do you think about the older people that, um... Yep, I think a lot of times about the older people that are here to me. What make you stay here? Just home. You feel safe. You move somewhere, you got to get adjusted to other people, different people. Here, everybody love one another and kind of stick together. The relationship you and Carson have is very special, huh? Yes, oh yeah. It's like a brother. I mean, it's, it's a relation you can, you can count on it better. It's not something you relate and love one another day and go on tomorrow. It's something deep down inside. So y'all can depend on each other? Yeah, okay. we do. He helps me and I help him. He don't run the plantation like his family ran it. Do he run it differently? Yes, he run it, yeah. You can say he run it differently. Everybody got their different ways. His daddy used to get up at 6.30 and meet up there at the office and be there when all other men think be there and, and here at 4 or 5 o'clock. Maybe Carson runs a little dim here running from out his house and over on the phone. He got, you got facts and you got computers and laptops and all that. Do the people have to get up as early in the morning to go out and work? Well, yeah, they still get up and they know it got to be planted and gathered. They get up at seven o'clock, six, seven o'clock, they be rolling. As often as possible, Antoinette will bring people to the Delta. Clergy, politicians, humanitarians. She'll do whatever she can to bring attention to the suffering, the poverty, and the slavery that still goes on up and down the Mississippi. If we walked up a little bit, you couldn't tell if I was in Africa, Jamaica, if I stood in front of this place. Yes, I met them a couple of years ago, and each one of the professors teach a semester on slavery in the 20th century. And they believe that by enlightening and educating the students is the best way that we can change the textbooks on the subject of slavery. That because as far as they have been told, because they haven't really been told his, what history up to the moment, because history includes yesterday, they really haven't been told what history has been about. So they think slavery ended 100 years ago. And they say, I never held any slaves. I don't know anything about that. Why should I be held responsible? Why should I be concerned about that? Now, they might get a little nervous hearing that slaves existed up through at least the 1970s. They might be a little unnerved by that. If you can really get them to see the connection between prison and peonage and the black community and their lives today, they might be a little uncomfortable for a minute, but they still think they don't personally have any uh, connection to that that they can do anything about. What they don't understand is how all of that and the fact of their being able to accept on a daily basis the harm that is done to black people in the United States creates in their own minds a form of insanity, a, a real a uh, white supremacist, uh, white superiority, white fear that they're not superior and supremacist. And all of that creates in them a need not only to objectify other people, but to see themselves in a way that can only be described as at least neurotic and possibly even psychotic a real need to see damage done to other people, to encourage you to believe that you really are better than they are, that you really are special, 
that they really aren't deserving of the same treatment as you are, that even if they don't get treated as a full citizen in their own country, that it doesn't matter because you are okay and that's all that matters. That's mental illness. I said, Dr. Ryan Walters, I need you to come to the Mississippi Delta with me. You have to see this. That this is worse than slavery. And the reason they say it's worse than slavery was because of the plantation system. There was at least a hint that you were there, you owned this property. And whoever that was that owned you had to take care of you and your family and so forth, even though they punished you and they oppressed you. In the system of peonage, since people didn't have to take care of you, and they were only interested in your labor, then you, were, you became a disposable item. Well, the next day I called him, gave him a date that we was going to be traveling to the Delta. Dr. Ryan Walter booked his flight, and he, he came down. He met with me and my colleagues. When he got here, he went to the Mississippi Delta. He was writing and publishing a book between them, and the title of the book was The Relationship Between the Department of Justice and the NWCP Files as it related to penance and involuntary servitude. Dr. Ryan Walters called Third World, Third World, World Press and put his book on hold because he had seen some things. You know, the question that many people ask, how, why he couldn't get away? Why didn't they, they leave? Everybody asks that question. That's the number one question people ask. But until you actually drive and see for yourself, you'll see what they put on People like uh, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan's daughter, uh, she took the poppy tour. NPR, uh, we've had many people to take the professors and students, uh, high school and college students to take the tour. I think it's just, oh my gosh, it's terrible the way she's living and she's working, so she shouldn't be living like this. I never thought I would actually get to see, I mean, I see it on a computer and stuff like you do. I never thought I would get to see it firsthand. It's a completely different experience. It's worse. That's all I gotta say. I think it's just insane how, how she worked so hard. She, I think she deserves better than what she got. It's crazy. It's sad because, I mean, her house, it is, her house, it, it doesn't look like somebody should be living in her house, like, it don't look like somebody should be living in her house, because nobody deserves to live like this. It was sad. And not one dry eye would be in the place when you walked out of there. The branches of poverty has taken its toll on people who live in a Delta, many times causing people to hurt their own loved ones. I'm real for you in this whole area. Mm -hmm. You said that you picked cotton. Yeah. We slayed. You slayed? We sure did. We got beat and we didn't beat. Who beat you? My father. Why did he beat you? Because we didn't get, we had to get two and three hundred pounds of cotton a day. You beat us because we didn't get it. And this is your home. Here. Let's walk yes, in. Yes, ma'am. This is your home. Yes, ma'am. And you're doing the best that you can. Yes, ma'am. How many of your grandchildren have you? I have, uh, I got five little ones and uh, three grown. Are you doing the best? I'm doing the best I can. To take care of, take care of my house and my grandkids. Well, I can them. see it needs a lot of repair. Oh, yeah. I'm on the back, the inside, or whatever. It's just it's needed. I'm going to see if I can just walk over here a little bit. And I want to see it. And I'm trying to do what I can to do for everybody. Too much I can do myself. And you can't get nobody to help you do nothing. You ain't got no money. You can't get nobody to do nothing. Can you read and write, Miss no, Cole? You never know, write my name. You can write my name. If you could apply for any funding, you couldn't even read the contract. And you couldn't even read it. No, ma'am. I get one of my grandkids to read. And it hurts me. It really do. It hurts me now. Because you know what? You get tired of running trying to get somebody to do something for you. You know what I'm saying? It hurts me. It really do. I just pray to God and go ahead on. This feces I had, uh, it's been out here for, I guess, uh, a year. I just got tired of bringing it in and out, and I, I got a toilet. This was the empty container for my 
for my makeshift toilet. That's how I used the bathroom. For a working woman. For four years, a working woman. A working woman. Yes, ma'am. Work every five days a week. Yes, ma'am. And this is how you live. This is how I live. Antoinette does whatever she can to help the people who live in the Delta. To be driven out because it came into another form called image. Those families did not get out of slavery. Their children are the descendants of those that go to bed hungry every night. They are self-made at medicating themselves with liquor that they can get their hands on. One family, I followed them for a day and they had to catch a yellow school bus to go and get food to eat for that one day. And the family said to me, they said, this may be the only meal that we get. And so we're gonna let the children eat first. So if there's anything left, we can get the scraps that's left. In 2010, you brought uh, Mayor Johnny Dupree of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, to a place in his own town. And he saw some things up close that he might have seen from afar in, in the past, but it sparked some things to happen. In Washington, D.C. at the time, at the National Press Club, conducting a, a press conference on slavery, penance, uh, involuntary servitude, and poverty. This woman emailed me and said, you got to come and see uh, the way that we're living here. Well, we was due to be in the, back into Louisiana the following day. And I told her I'll be out the next day. And when I went there, I uh, couldn't believe what I was looking at. I mean, that could not have. If I could have went and just erased what I saw, I would have because it was it was a lot for me to deal with. And she started to she started taking me out to other people's houses. And when I got there, I said, "How could this be in Hattiesburg, Mississippi?" It was a a nice town, you know, infrastructure there. And, but on right five miles outside the town, there was this, this poverty that you couldn't believe that exists. And my situation was a little bit red tape too, so they had to go back to the table and look at how could they help. And he said he's not gonna make any promises, but they're trying to be creative in what they can do to help you with your house. Because I, I saw her house, yes. and it's, it almost has to be torn down and come up again. Mm -hmm. That's what, if there's no repairs yeah. that can be well, done she, to that house. Well, and, and, you know, and, and that's what we actually told her to start mm -hmm. with. It, was, it really costs too much to do that, and we mm -hmm. gotta be creative to see if we can make it work mm -hmm. some kind of way. We, we pledge to do that. Mm -hmm. Just hold on, Lou. I know, it, I know it's hard. Okay, but when we go back to the table, not only, I didn't say the mayor, we're going to go back and talk to people that can help get involved. See if they can come in and bring in some manpower or donate some supplies or, you know, to help get 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 your home. Nobody's helped me. And when I saw this here, I said, well, this is my chance. Well, I can get some help. I know it's a lot of people I hear need the same thing. Right. But they don't have to deal with, well, some of them probably do. And you can see this. Look at this. My sister, yes, yeah. I, and, I see. And so what I want to say to you is when I go back and, and, and do what I need to do, and people say, Antoinette, how can we help? The sister need a house to be built. What could you do? You understand? Right. So those kind of things. Yeah. So just, just give us, hold on uh, a little bit, I, I, hold on a little bit I, while alone. Yeah. All right? <laughs> and so uh, I was grateful that uh, Mayor Johnny Dupree, uh, he agreed to take the poverty tour. And not only did he take the poverty tour, but he did something her effort brought support to the community and recently in 2012, 100 homes were built for some of the most needy to live in. And I want to thank uh, uh, Benita uh, Connor and as well as the, uh, the Hattiesburg South Haven, uh, the Hattiesburg Muhammad Study Group for really working to help get those homes. In 2010, Antoinette's own personal battle began affecting her work in the Delta. Shortly before Antoinette triumphed in getting the 100 homes in Mississippi, she had a major setback herself. A year 2000 knee replacement she had became infected. And then we tried two weeks, but I never could go one month. I always had to go back. What were they doing? Draining my leg. Hmm. Yeah, draining the leg. And we bandage it up again, so the bandages have to be changed every two 
24 hours until I learned how to pack it myself. Mm -hmm. How'd you get there? Walter. Mm -hmm. My colleague that stuck with me during the whole process. I think if it wasn't for him, you know, the strength of him and, and Joan, his wife, you know, I don't know about him. Mm -hmm. I was tired, exhausted, but they kept pushing me. If they didn't drain, what would have happened? I could have died from infection. So I was on antibiotics for like two and a half years. Every day, I was on antibiotics. She needed the care. And she needed somebody to drive her, and she needed somebody to be with her that she trusted and she felt comfortable with. And I know that was me. And I just knew that was, I had to do it. It's no problem. I just told us, look, Antoinette, when you need to go, just call me. Let me know. Whatever I was doing, I just stopped what I was doing and just bring her. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I knew, uh, I, I saw the same passion she had. She deserved to have the best care. And she needed to not be worried about how she's going to get to the hospital and who was going to bring her and stuff like that. I just made that clear with her that anytime you need to go to the hospital, anything you need to done at, at the house, let me know what it is and I'll come take care of it for you. After two years of fighting, Antoinette lost her battle. So during the times that we was taking the poverty tours, I was in so much pain. I mean, really, in a lot of pain. Sometimes I would end up going back in my car and sitting there and just crying because I was in so much pain. And there was times I couldn't even walk. I had to utilize a wheelchair and crutches, so that went on for about a year. And then finally they did amputate my right leg. One might think that Antoinette would have given up, but the loss of her leg did not slow her down one moment. Just months after losing her leg, she was back out doing research and helping people in the Delta. There's this thing that I believe that when you help somebody, you're only helping yourself. I believe that. And I believe that God called me to do the work, and I believe that he was going to supply what I needed. I didn't have any health insurance because of a pre-existing condition. And I still felt like I was blessed. Because when I go home, I can turn on the shower, I have hot water. I can drive my car to the doctor. I had a hospital to go to. And I had money to buy my medication. Well, I just went with people that didn't have those things. So I didn't have time to feel sorry for myself when despite of what I was going through, I was still better off than a lot of people. Many times Antoinette would have the money to buy a prosthetic leg, but she would use the money to help others. And, and the scripture tell us, when one of us hurt, we're all supposed to be hurt because what is done to my sisters, what is done to my brothers, what has been done to those that came before me is already done to me. Mm -hmm. We can't separate ourselves mm -hmm. from the pain. We can't, and that's the problem now. We have allowed this system that we don't want to learn anything about to continue to separate us based upon light skin, dark skin, what side of town you live on, what you drive, what you eat, where have you traveled to. These are the type of things that have separated us. And I just want to thank, thank the Father for all my sisters and my brothers who are really concerned because you know what? We're carrying a heavy burden. In March of 2012, God sent an angel to Antoinette. Tell me about Erica. Erica passed away. I had the surgery in March, March, on March the 14th. Erica passed away in February. Erica's boyfriend, Ellis, who I met over the internet, was the person who donated the leg to me. And they contacted me and they said, Ms. Sherelle, I don't know if this will work for you, but I have a, uh, my girlfriend died 
and she had, uh, she was an amputee. And I wrote him back and I said, well, I'm above the knee amputee to amputee of the right leg. He writes me back and says she was above the knee amputee of the right leg. Prosthetic legs are specially fitted devices and finding one that fits you is not an easy task. Very, very slim. It's like, you know, playing a lottery, you know. One to find someone that has the right leg amputated and above the knee um, amputation, that was one thing. But she was the same height, 5'5". Five, five. The only thing different with, with Eric and I was different nationalities. So she was white and you were black? Yes, yes. And I decided that the foot part of the leg, I did not want to change it. Um, and there was a reason. The first thing I want to do is have a butterfly uh, drawn on the leg, in, on the foot. And so Erica, the butterfly would be called Erica. But it also symbolizes to me that white and black people, and people of color can walk together if we just try. And I think with Erica, she's still here. She's gonna help me to continue to do this mission. And I'm very happy for that. Being the mover and shaker she is, Antoinette has decided to start a foundation to help others in her very position. I wanna start a foundation uh, for amputees, people who cannot afford to have, uh, to purchase a, a prosthetic leg like myself. And if the people who love one uh, passed away or someone that can afford to get another one, they just want to get another leg and they still have some good use in it, they can donate it to me. And when they donate it to me, I will let the doctor know that I, what I have. And when the doctor find out what I have and somebody come into his office uh, that has no insurance and need a leg, he will send them back to me to pick the leg up and then there it is. They will have a leg like I, I have one. The one thing that I discuss with Bernard is that I want to see people happy just like I am. A typical leg could cost about $20,000. But the fitting, the process of simply getting the leg to work sometimes could cost as much as $5,000. $5,000 Antoinette did not have. Uh, when they discussed uh, buying, uh, doing a fundraiser to buy a leg for me, well, if they would have gave me the money, I wouldn't have bought a lady. I'm being honest with you. I would have took, I would have taken the money and either dug a water well in Africa, I helped somebody else in need. Because I can live without a lady, but people can't live without clean water and food and things of that nature. Because of her efforts, Antoinette's doctor, Dr. Bernard, donated the fitting services to her. The leg will take weeks before it is ready, but much work has to be done in the meantime. In August, Antoinette sat back on the road to check on some of the families she had adopted. But when she gets to Denise's, she discovers that tragedy has struck the family. Her pitiful two-bedroom shanty has suffered a major fire and is now uninhabitable. Now Denise and her children are crammed into Denise's mother, Shanty, who lives next door. I just lost everything I had and I did own all your I lost the children, clothes, and everything. Mm -hmm. How is it living with your mother? Is it enough room for you? Well, in a way, it is, and then in a way, it's not. <laughs> was everybody, was you home when this happened? Uh-uh. No, I was down my mother's house. Everybody's home. Yeah. Everybody get back. But I opened the door, I locked the door, my house on fire. So I panicked and ran out. I guess it's about to help, but it was too late. Yeah, I was on the way. Mm -hmm. And one thing about my car right there and there, so my car, my back end caught, you know, fire, and uh, so I know I had to get rid of that too. How long did it take the fire department to come out? Ooh, well, yeah. I really can't tell you because I just was so scared and nervous at the time. But all the children was out. Mm -hmm. It was already crammed into like a very small house with, I think it was two bedrooms uh, in each one of those units. Mm -hmm. And so now that her house is burned down, she, she has to move with her mom. You know? There will be mountains that I would have to climb. And there and will be very difficult for, for them, you know. They live, every job is almost 35 to 40 minutes away. And that's just one way. 
and so they really they don't have transportation there's no no uh, public bus services that's running in those areas that would take them to a job what do you want to do for Denise I would like to see Denise get a home really uh, she has two teenager girls and I would like to see mentors for the little for her young girls and you know to have these little girls get the education that's needed so that they would not end up in the situation like their mom you know because what happens it breeds a new generation every time and so if we're going to really do something to make a difference we have to reach out to the youth and we have to be more active and involved in their lives to make sure they have the resources that it takes so that they will not be a product of the environment that they are in so home is what Denise is asking for, but the girls are asking for education. Hey, you right there, sticking out there in the field. It's all weed out there. You know okay. Know? And what is that? That's a cop cop weed or pig weed or something they call it. And so you had to pull this out. This is like a weed. Mm -hmm. You pull that out and get that out of here. Really, you know, they're looking for jobs. Um, from a scale from one to ten, at least seven people have already have, has said to us, "Look, give me a job. I can take it from there." They, said, they was asking for work. If a bank or someone could, could donate or give that to you, would, would you appreciate that for them? Oh yes, certainly. If anyone can help uh, to buy land for them and to build a house for them or put uh, a home on that land, of course they would be most appreciated for that home. And uh, certainly we would have to teach them uh, how to live. You know, we take for granted that people know that, but you know, to live uh, uh, within their means, how to take care of a home. You know, most people who have never owned a home, they don't know anything about paying uh, taxes or whatever they have to do to maintain that property. So we just can't give them the, the, these things. We have to teach them along the way. And that's for all the, most of the families that I've come in contact with or they would end up back in the same situation again. You have to go back and educate people on the fact of how to look for slavery, what to look for. You know, we can drive by a building uh, uh, that has five units and just assume that's an apartment complex, complex there, but the conditions in which the people live in uh, could be slavery. And so, and I know of a case like that where a young man uh, was put off the plantation. I said, what plantation? He says, right down the road there. I said, where? And he described it to me and it was just an apartment complex that I had just passed. You see, because we're not taught. We're, we're looking for the big house with the uh, the weeping willows and the uh, big oak trees with the moss hanging down and a big house in the front. That's not what it looks like today. It's a total different beast today. And so if we are not taught to what to look for, you don't know what you're looking at. And so when I started to research at the National Archives and started to look in these files, I mean, boxes and boxes of documents from the NAACP, letters from uh, the Department of Justice, FBI files, letters to three presidents of the United States, where people was writing saying, look, you have to free those that's still in slavery. And I'm talking about white citizens as well that was doing the writing, that was advocating for people that was held in this type of bondage of penance and, and, and involuntary servitude. What I found in those conditions were people, 2012, still on modern day plantations. Yes. Later. How do you get, get all this, this, this stuff? Toxic. How do I detox myself? Great question. Art. I love the expressions of art. And so I paint. Um, so I spend a lot of time, you know, working with other artists, you know, colors, happy things, to get away from the things that, you know, I don't think I can ever empty my mind. But I do need to escape sometimes just for sanity. And all is that that relief for me, you know. I am in the process of opening for art gallery right now, another expression of art for me. Um, and also to uh, be an outlet for other young people who 
use art as a means of expressing themselves, I finally learned a lot about the artist's mind and how they escape uh, so many things. I, I heard people say that they escape through art, but it wasn't until I uh, came across all the poverty that I saw around me and all the pain and suffering that I had to find a way out. Mm -hmm. You know, so I had to find something that really, um, that I enjoy, and I really enjoy art. There's a famous quote by Harriet Tubman, the leader of the Underground Railroad. She once said, she could have freed a whole lot more slaves if they only knew that they were slaves. What has to happen to, to, to solve this problem? I like what Dr. King said in one of his quotes. He said, there could not be a consensus until there's an awareness. And so the first thing we have to do is bring about awareness so that we can put the necessary resources in many of these forgotten about areas uh, to bring in resources that would empower people uh, to, to rise above these impoverished conditions. The lack of resources is the main problem in all of the rural areas and sometimes urban areas. And so I think that as uh, we study poverty and look at what can we do differently to, to improve someone's life, healthcare, education. Everyone is not going to attend college, but we can have vocational training. Um, we take for granted uh, public transportation, but that's a, big, that's a big problem in areas like rural areas where people do not have the uh, means of getting around from jobs or to libraries. And in some places, there's not even a public library. So certainly I would like to say until we uh, uh, can have awareness, we will never have a, a, a consensus to solve the problem. Though the fight against poverty is often tough, Antoinette lives for the minor and major triumphs she encounters. Where do you go from here? Reaching out to people. Uh, Antoinette can't solve the problem. It has to be working collectively to ensure that, that we help to free other people that's living in those impoverished conditions. No one wants to live like that. And through prayer, <coughs> I was led to call the investment company and ask them to donate the property back. And so what they did, they donated it, the property to Union Grove. In return, we deeded it to Wade and Priscilla Brown. And this way, we knew that this would give them a start of uh, having owning their own property and everything was clear. And I also want to say that the 2006, 7, and 8 taxes are paid. And we want to also thank Feed the Children that's not here that came out, came to Lambert to visit from Oklahoma and mail back a check to Union Grove Outreach Ministry so that we can do this for the Wade and Brown family. And this, are, this is your receipt for your taxes that they've been paid. And here is your, your all over the world right now to come and donate lumber, their help, their services to building this family a home. This is just one of the families throughout Mississippi that need help. 